Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about complex numbers. At this point, we know a lot about factoring polynomials and finding their roots. Still, there are some polynomials we can't factor. There's no way to reduce them into smaller factors, so they're irreducible, and they simply have no roots. There's just no way to solve something like x squared plus 1 equals 0, right? There's no roots to x squared plus 1, because for that to be true, we need x squared equal to negative 1, but when you square any number, it becomes a positive, right? If we square positive 2, then that becomes positive 4. Right? But if we square negative 2, then that's going to become positive 4 as well. The negatives hit each other, they cancel out. This, this pattern is going to happen for any negative number, any positive number, and zeros are just going to stay zeros. So there's no way that we can square a number and have it become negative. But what if that wasn't the whole story? What if there was some special number we hadn't seen that, when squared, does not become positive? That's an interesting idea. If that's the case, we better explore. Let's go. We're looking for a way to solve x squared equals negative 1. In other words, we're looking for something that is the square root of negative 1. We're looking for something that when you square it, it spits out negative 1. So here's a wacky idea. Why don't we just make up a new number? We'll try something really crazy and we'll just create a number out of whole cloth. We'll imagine a special number that becomes negative 1 when squared. So we're making a new number. And since we're using our imagination to think of this new thing, we'll call it an imaginary number and we'll denote it with the symbol i. Um, so we know that i equals square root of negative 1, whatever that means, which means that when you square i, you get negative 1, right? The square root of 4 is 2, because when you square 2, you get 4. So when you square i, since it's the square root of negative 1, you get negative 1. So these two ideas <clears throat> are how we're going to define this new thing. When you're writing it, I'd also recommend writing it with a little curve on the bottom, just so you don't get it confused. Sometimes if you're writing quickly, you might wind up like not even putting a dot, at which point it'd be hard to see whether or not you meant to put down 1 or you meant to put down i. So I recommend putting a tiny little curve at the bottom and then a dot like that. When you're writing it by hand, that way you'll have some way of being able to clearly see that you're talking about the imaginary number and not a normal number. With this new idea of i, we can solve the original equation. Since i is equal to the square root of negative 1, we can just take the square root of both sides. And remember, when you take the square root of both sides, you have to introduce a plus minus. Square root of both sides of an equation, plus minus shows up no matter what. So we get x equals plus or minus i. Let's check it really quickly. So if we have positive i squared, then that's going to be equal to i squared which is equal to negative 1, as we just had here. And our other possibility, if we have negative i squared, well, negative times negative becomes positive, so we've got positive i squared, but i squared is, once again, negative 1, so checks out, both of these are indeed solutions, so we found how to solve x squared equals negative 1. We've got this new idea of taking a square root of negative 1, which means when we square that thing, this thing that we've just created, the imaginary number, we will have negative 1. We can now use this idea to take the square root of any negative number. So we can't, we're not just limited to taking the square root of negative 1, we can do it on anything. We just separate out that root negative 1, that will become an i, and then we take the root as normal. For example, root negative 25 would become square root of negative 25, so we pull out negative 1, so that's the same thing as 25 times negative 1. So we separate this out, we break it into two square roots, a rule we're allowed to do, times square root negative 1. So negative 1, root negative 1 becomes i, root 25, that's 5, so we've got 5i out of that. We look at the square root of negative 98, well that's the square root of 98 times negative 1 inside. So we can separate that out and we'll get square root of 98 times root negative 1. So root negative 1, that'll become i, but what's the square root of 98? We're not quite sure, so we need to break it up a bit more. Look at how we can break that into its multiplicative factors. 98 is the same thing as 49 times 2. Square root of 49 is 7. 7 times 7, 49. So we've got 7 times root 2, i. Finally, square root of negative 60. We can see that as 60 times negative 1. So we separate out the negative 1 square root 60, so this becomes i. What is root 60? How can we break that into its factors? Well, we've got a 6 times a 10. That's still not quite enough, though, so we break that up some more. We've got 2 times 3 for 6, and 2 times 5 for 10, still times i. We see we've got a 2 here and a 2 here, so we can pull them out because they come as a pair. 2 times the square root of 3 times 5, can't do that, so we might as well just turn it into one number. 
So 2 root 15 times i. So we can now take the square root of any negative number by having this idea of i, the imaginary number. With this idea of the imaginary number in place, we can create a new set of numbers which we'll call the complex numbers, and we denote it with c. If you're writing that by hand, you make a normal c, and then you make a little vertical line like that. We still want to be able to talk about the real numbers, which remember we denote with this weird r symbol. So we'll need them to appear along with i. So we need to have real numbers show up along with this imaginary number. And so we just saw that we can have imaginary numbers that had this real component multiplied against them, right? We took the square root of 20, negative 25, and we got 5i. So we're going to have to have a sum number times i, and we'll also want to have a real part, a. So we'll have the real part will be a. A is the real part, and then we'll have the imaginary part will be bi. bi is the imaginary part. And A and B are both real numbers. They're just coming out of that real set like usual. So this gives us an entirely new form of number. As opposed to just being stuck with real numbers, we've got a way of having a real number and a complex number both interacting with each other. They'll come together as a package, and this is the idea of the complex numbers. Two complex numbers are equal when the parts in one number are equal to the parts in the other. So if we have a plus bi and we're told that's equal to c plus di, then that means the real parts, the real parts have to be equal. So we know that a and c are equal. Also, we know that the imaginary parts have to be equal. Both parts have to be equal for this equality to hold. So bi and di are the same thing, which means that b and d must be the same thing, since clearly i is going to be the same thing on both sides. Great. All right, so how do we do our basic arithmetic with these things? Addition and subtraction first. We add and subtract complex numbers pretty much like we're used to. a plus bi plus c plus di just means we're going to combine our real parts, will become a plus c, and our imaginary parts, bi and di, will come together and we'll get b plus d all times i, right? B, bi plus di becomes b plus d times i. Same thing over here. If we've got a minus a plus bi minus c plus di, then we've got a minus c, and the bi's do the same thing with the di's. So we're going to have b minus d, because remember there's that minus symbol there. So b minus d there. a plus bi minus c plus di, and we can also think of that as just distributing this negative sign like we do before. So we're now adding a negative c and a negative di. That's one way of looking at subtraction. So real parts add subtract together, and imaginary parts add subtract together. Other than the fact that they stay separate, it pretty much works like normal. So as long as they stay separate, they sort of stay on their two sides. Imaginaries can't interact directly with the reals. Reals can't interact directly with the imaginaries when we're keeping an addition and subtraction. It's pretty much just normal. Let's look at two examples. 5 plus 2i plus 8 minus 4i. So our 5 and 8, those will be able to interact together because they're both you know, real numbers. And heck, let's color code that just so we can see exactly what's going on. So with our colors before, with red representing reals again, we have 5 plus 8. And then it'll be plus, and then our imaginaries interact as well. 2i minus 4i. 5 plus 8, we get 13. And 2i plus 4i, we get, sorry, 2i minus 4i, because this was a negative 4i here, we get negative 2i, which we could also write as 13 minus 2i. 13 plus negative 2i, 13 minus 2i means the same thing. Great. If we did it with subtraction, 5 plus 2i minus quantity 8 minus 4i, then we can distribute this negative sign and we get negative 8 and they'll cancel out the minus there and we'll get plus 4i. So 5 minus 8 plus 2i plus 4i. So 5 minus 8 becomes negative 3 plus 6i. Great. All right. Multiplication is pretty much going to work very similarly as well. Now notice we've got two things in this sort of factor looking form. So we use it as, we do it as FOIL expansion. We're going to do that same idea of distribution. We'll multiply against in the same way we distributed before. So A will multiply on C and A will multiply on DI. So we get AC and ADI. And then bi will multiply on c, and bi will multiply on di. So we'll get bi on c gets us bci, and bi on di will get us bdi squared. Now remember, i squared equals negative 1, so when we've got this i squared here, it cancels out, and it's like we've got subtraction. So we put together 
are real components now. BD and AC gets us AC minus BD because it was negative BD. And we've got our imaginary components ADI and BCI, so we've got AD plus BC. I. Remember this, I squared equals negative 1, so it will just transform during the process of simplification. Now, you could memorize this formula right here, but I wouldn't recommend memorizing this formula right here because you already know the FOIL expansion, and as long as you can remember I squared equals negative 1, that'll keep it easier. That's the better way to do it. All right, let's see some examples. 1 plus 2i times 5 minus i. 1 times 5 becomes 5. 1 times negative i becomes minus i. 2i times 5 becomes 10i. 2i times negative i becomes minus 2, and we've got 2i, so 2i squared. Once again, i squared is equal to negative 1, cancels out, becomes a plus. So 5 minus i plus 10i plus 2, so 5 and 2, they combine to give us 7. And minus i plus 10i, they combine to give us plus 9i. Great. Next one, 6 plus 10i times 5 plus 3i, so 6 times 5 is 30. 6 times 3i is 18i, 10i times 5 is 50i, and 10i times 3i is 30i squared. Once again, remember, i squared is negative 1, so we've got minus 30, at which point our negative 30 and positive 30, they cancel each other out, and we're left with just 18i plus 50i, so we get a total of 68i. Great. Final one, division. Now, division is a little more tricky. Consider if we had 10 minus 15i over 1 plus 2i. Now, at first we might think, oh, hey, we've got 10 and 1, we've got negative 15 and 2i, so we'll get 10 over 1 and negative 15 over 2 because the i's will cancel out. But that would be wrong. We have to divide by the entire denominator, not just bits and pieces. For example, to see why this has to be the case, imagine if we had 5 plus 5 over 3 plus 2. That's really 10 over 5, which equals 2. But we could get confused and think that that was going to be 5 over 3 plus 5 over 2. But division does not distribute like that. We're not allowed to do that. So we can't do the same thing here with our 1 plus 2i. We can't break it up and distribute the pieces because it's nonsense in real numbers, so it's definitely going to be nonsense in the complex. What if we break it up and we put 1 plus 2i onto the 10, and then we put 1 plus 2i onto the 15, negative 15i separately. So we get 10 over 1 plus 2i, and we get plus uh, negative 15 over 1 plus 2i. Well, that's true. We broke it up. We can do that with normal things. We could have, if we wanted to, going back to 5 plus 5 over 3 plus 2, we could have that as 5 over 3 plus 2 plus 5 over 3 plus 2, but that doesn't help us. We'd still have to divide, ultimately, we have to divide by this 1 plus 2i, right? We don't know how to divide by a complex number yet. That is our problem. So simply put, we have no idea how to divide by complex numbers. That's our problem. Addition and subtraction, they made natural sense. Real numbers stuck together, imaginary numbers stuck together. FOIL was able to allow us to do multiplication. We just did normal distribution, and we remember the rule that i squared becomes negative 1. But division, we don't have a good handle on what it means to divide by a complex number. So that's tough. Now, what we could do, if there was some clever way to get rid of having a complex number in the denominator, if we could somehow make it into an alternate form where we disappeared the complex number in the denominator, we'd be good. Huh. To figure out this clever method that we want, first notice something you might have seen while we were working on quadratics. If you have x minus 2 times x plus 2, you get x squared and then plus 2x but also minus 2x, right? Since we've got the minus 2 and the plus 2 here, they wind up canceling each other out. And so we're left with just x squared minus 4, and there is no middle term with just x. There's no x that shows up. We're able to get rid of it and have only the doubled and the no x whatsoever. We can expand this idea to complex numbers. So we do a similar pattern, 1 minus 2i, 1 plus 2i. Let's work that out. We get 1 minus 2i plus 2i minus 4i squared. So plus 2i minus 2i, they cancel each other out because we've got the negative here and the plus here. And then we have 4i squared, so that will cancel and become a plus, and we get 1 plus 4 equals 5. So we've been able to figure out a way to multiply this thing and get just a real number. So if we use this pattern a plus bi times a minus bi, you automatically get a real number. When you multiply it out, it results in a number that has no imaginary part. You can get that i to disappear entirely and get something that's completely real. 
This idea we call the complex conjugate. It comes up often enough and it becomes important enough that we give it a special name, complex conjugate, and we also give it a special symbol. We denote it with a bar over the number. So if we've got a plus bi as our complex number, we can talk about its conjugate with a bar over it, and that is a minus bi. The conjugate of a plus bi is a minus bi, and what's the conjugate of a minus bi? Well, we just flip it again back to a plus, so vice versa. a plus bi is the conjugate of a minus bi, the conjugate of a minus bi is a plus bi. They just wind up flipping between the each other as long as we're doing conjugates. Notice that whenever you multiply a complex number by its conjugate, it always results in a real number. So by multiplying with a conjugate, we can get rid of imaginary things. We can get rid of it. So multiply by a conjugate, you always get a real number out of it. So let's look at that. a plus bi times a minus bi, we get the a squared, and we'll get minus abi plus abi, right? Plus here, minus here. Those cancel out. i squared is a negative one, so that causes that to become a plus. So we'll wind up with a squared plus b squared, no i. A and B were just real numbers, so we've got something that's entirely real. We started with imaginary things, but by multiplying these together, choosing carefully what we had, we're able to knock out imaginaries entirely, get something that's just real. With this idea of complex conjugates in mind, we can now deal with division. We simply turn the denominator into a real number by multiplying top and bottom with the denominator's conjugate, right? We want to get the bottom to turn into just a real number, because we know how to divide by reals. We just put it on a fraction. So c plus di, we need to multiply that by c minus di. Of course, we can't just multiply the bottom because we feel like it, so we also have to multiply the top by c minus di as well, because something over itself is always 1, as long as you didn't start with 0 over 0. Then the world explodes. But as long as it's something over something, and that something isn't 0, you get 1. So c minus di over c minus di, we can do that. We just trust intrinsically that dividing something by itself is 1. That's the nature of division. That's the point of it. So ac plus DD, bd plus bc minus ad times i over c squared plus d squared. That's what it'll wind up simplifying to. And we could work this out, and we would see that this formula winds up working out. I don't want you to memorize this formula. I don't even really see a good point to work through it. The important thing to know is just remember to multiply top and bottom. Remember to multiply top and bottom by the denominator's conjugate. This idea of being able to multiply by a conjugate, that's the really cool thing. You could memorize a formula, but it's not going to help you to memorize a formula because it's hard to, hard to recall a formula like this. It's much easier to remember, oh, I've got division of a complex number, multiply by the conjugate because I want to get rid of real numbers. Have to multiply top and bottom though because, of course, if you did otherwise, you'd just be playing fantasy. You have to multiply by the same thing on the top and the bottom to keep it what you started with. All right, let's see an example. 10 minus 15i over 1 plus 2i. So we want to multiply by the conjugate of 1 plus 2i, conjugate of 1 plus 2i. If we wanted to, we could express that with a bar all over the top of it, which would be 1 minus 2i. We multiply by that, and we know we'll have gotten to just a real number. 1 minus 2i multiplies top and bottom, and it does have to come in parentheses because it's a whole thing multiplying some other whole thing. You don't just get to multiply bits and pieces. So we work that out. 10 times 1 gets us 10. 10 times negative 2i gets us minus 20i. Negative 15i times 1 gets us minus 15i. Negative 15i times negative 2i gets us plus 30i squared. What's on the bottom? We have 1 plus 2i times 1 minus 2i. 1 times 1 gets us 1. Plus 2i, minus 2i, those will cancel out, right? 1, sorry, minus 2i, minus 2i, plus 2i, and then minus 4i squared. Remember, i squared becomes negatives, negative 1. So we cancel out like that. And then we also see, hey, negative 2i plus 2i, they cancel each other out. What's this become next? We combine things. 10 minus 30, our real parts on the top, becomes negative 20. Minus 20i minus 15i becomes minus 35i. What's on the bottom? 1 plus 4 is 5. So we can divide negative 20 over 5 minus 35i over 5. So that gets us negative 4 minus 7i. Great. All right, now we're at a point, now that we understand the basics of how to work with complex numbers, we're now at a point where you can actually see how to factor irreducible quadratics. It's now possible for us to factor previously irreducible quadratics and find their roots. So x squared plus 1 we see is now factored into x plus i and x minus i. Let's check this. We'd get this would be equal to x squared minus ix plus ix minus i squared. Whoops, 
Uh, my I X didn't write that whole thing. Those cancel each other out. I squared becomes plus one. So we get X squared plus one. Sure enough, it checks out, and we found a way to be able to factor this thing that or before we could not factor. It used to be irreducible, but now we see through the complex numbers, it's not irreducible at all. Totally factorable. We can revisit the quadratic formula and use it to find the roots of these supposedly irreducible quadratics. What used to be irreducible for us is no longer. So we can use the quadratic formula. Previously, we couldn't use it when b squared minus 4a was less than 0 because there was no square root of a negative number. But now we know that just means imaginary number. So if our discriminant is b squared minus 4a shows us it's less than 0, then that means not that we have no answers, but we just have imaginary answers. Cool. Furthermore, because of the plus minus square root of b squared minus 4ac part in the quadratic formula, we see that complex conjugates must come in conjugate pairs, right? If b squared minus 4ac is less than 0, so this spits out stuff times i, then we've got this plus or minus thing, so it's going to be plus stuff i minus stuff i. So we've got one version that's a plus i, one version that's a minus i. That's what happens when we're doing a conjugate pair, right? We have a plus bi, its conjugate is a minus bi. So if we've got stuff plus stuff i and minus stuff i, that's what we've got right there. All right, so if we've got a polynomial where we know that a plus bi is a root, that is to say when you plug it in you get zero, then we know that a minus bi has to also be a root. These things come in conjugate pairs all the time. So we've talked a lot about the complex numbers, but we probably have this nagging question in the back of our head are they real? You know, maybe, maybe they're clearly not real numbers because we're saying they're not the real numbers, which is, you know, numbers like 5, 0, pi, square root 2. We've been working with them all up until now. But are they real? Are they legitimate? Are they something that we really can use and not be like, we shouldn't be using these? I mean, you know, for goodness sake, they've got the word imaginary right in their definition. Do we really want to be trying to do science or math with something that's inherently imaginary, right? So, Let's think about this. What does it mean for a number to be legitimate? What is this idea of a number being a legitimate number that is valid for science, valid for math? Now, we'd probably all agree one, two, three, these are totally valid. I mean, for goodness sake, you could pick up one rock, you could pick up two rocks, you could pick up three rocks, right? We could actually have these things in our hands and say, look, I've got that many objects. And we might not be able to pick up five billion rocks, but we can get this idea of, well, we could count that many rocks in front of us. So that seems pretty valid, right? These nice whole numbers, perfectly reasonable. But what about one half being a real number? So one half, that seems pretty valid. Because we could take a pizza and we could cut the pizza in half, right? We take a pizza, we cut it down the middle, and now all of a sudden we've got two chunks of pizza, right? One here, one here. We're left with two objects that come together to form a whole. But at the same time, we could say, well, this is one object and this is one object, so it's one and one. But we could also say it's one half of what we originally started with, and it's one half of what we originally started, so it's one half and one half, right? So there's a little bit more questionable, it's a little bit more questionable that this is valid, right? Because can you actually pick up a half object? No, it's an object in and of itself, but it's connected to other things. So it's not perfectly valid, not as valid as the rocks. We can grab rocks, we can hold rocks, but we can definitely believe in half numbers, right? We can believe in, in rational numbers, we can believe in fractions. Seems reasonable. Well, okay. What about something even more slippery? What about the negative numbers, right? Negatives, that's pretty bad. Or we could go even worse and we can talk about irrational numbers, right? How can you possibly hold negative one rock? What does that mean? Can you hold root two rock? Can you hold pi rock? You can't hold these things in your hand, so are they valid? We can't cut a pi slice of pizza. We can't cut a root two slice of pizza. Or, or can't, I mean, what does this mean now? Are they really valid? We've certainly used them a lot before. We're used to using them, so they seem reasonable in that way, but are, are they things that are real in the real world? So, you know, don't worry, they're not illegitimate. It doesn't mean that they're illegitimate because you can't hold them in your hand. We can use them to represent things in the real world, right? We can talk about an object falling with negative numbers. We can say, you know, it's going a negative height as opposed to a positive height where it goes up, it goes a negative height where it goes down. Or maybe you have $100 in your bank account, but then you pull out 150, that leaves you with negative $50 in your bank account. So you've got an overdrawn bank account we talk about with negative numbers. So that seems pretty reasonable. We could also talk about root two. Root two is able to connect the sides of a square. If we've got a square where the sides are the same, 
all the sides are the same on our square, then the connection between one side and the diagonal is side times root 2. So we can figure that out from the Pythagorean theorem. So that makes sense. There's some stuff going on. Or if we, you know, we go ahead and we look at a circle, we'll see pi showing up, right? If we want to talk about the circumference of a circle, pardon my circle, not quite perfect, circle, it'll be pi times 2 times the radius, right? So there's pi showing up. Or if we want to talk about the area, it'll be pi times the radius squared. So there's relationships going on in circles. And circles are real life things. We see circles in lots of places. We see spheres, other circular objects in lots of places in real life. So it seems reasonable to count root 2, pi, negative 1. They're all valid numbers, not because we can hold it in our hand, but because we can use it for totally reasonable things. So ultimately, these numbers are real, in quotes, not to say real numbers, but real numbers, numbers that we believe in because they have meaning, because they are useful for something. A number is valid not because we can hold it in our hands, but because it is useful and or interesting. That's what makes a number a valid number that we want to work with, is because we can either use it in real things or it's really interesting and fascinating. It's telling us cool stuff. After all, math is a language, right? And in language, we can talk about things that aren't just concrete. So you can talk about things like cat and tree, but at the same time, you can also express abstract concepts, things like justice and freedom, right? You can walk down the street and you can point at a cat and you can point at a tree, but you can't really hold a justice in your hand and you can't say, oh, look, here is a freedom, right? They're not they're not things that you can hold. They're not tangible, real things. They're abstract concepts that like require us to think in this other way. And that's sort of how the numbers work. One, two, three, they're representing concrete things that we can really hold. But we can also talk about abstract ideas like the square root of two, pi, that are telling us relationships that are really useful. We might not be able to hold it in our hand, but it's still a really useful idea. So it's just as valid. You know, cat and justice are both valid things because they're useful to us. They represent something worthwhile. They represent something interesting. It's the exact same way with the complex numbers. This is how it is with the complex numbers. You can't hold I rocks in your hands. You can't hold 52 I in your bank account. But you still, they still have valid. They still are meaning. There's still meaning there. They're still valid. They still have meaning. In fact, they have direct connections to the real world. So that might be our other issue is like, okay, so I can believe in the fact that numbers are just, numbers get to be valid when they're interesting. But are they useful? Can we use them in the real world? Sure enough, you can. Complex numbers show up a lot in electrical engineering. They show up in advanced physics, and they show up in other fields of science. They also show up in lots of advanced mathematics. If you're interested in mathematics and the really, really high interesting stuff, complex numbers start to show up a lot. They're totally valid. You can prove real things. They're really meaningful. By using complex numbers, we can actually model real-world phenomena and we can make accurate predictions. So complex numbers have, are proven to be useful. We can actually use a complex number and get truth out of it that we can then measure in the real world. You don't get a complex number of things, but you can have a complex number help you on your way to finding an accurate measurement, to finding something and predicting something to actually work. So complex numbers, totally valid in terms of being useful in the real world and also just as a thought construct. So in many ways, the name imaginary is unfortunate. They're not imaginary in terms of like, they don't count, they aren't really there. And they're just imaginary because the name stuck. There's no reason that they are less valid than real numbers. They aren't less valid. They're just as valid as any other number. They're not real numbers, which is to say they're not R. They're not those numbers that we talked about before, but the complex numbers can still represent reality. So they're not real numbers, but they still show reality. They're imaginary, but only in name. They're actually things that can be used to show real life. They tell us all sorts of useful things, and they're pretty cool. So complex numbers, legitimate, valid. They're not real numbers, but they are real in the sense that they are a part of the real world. All that said, nonetheless, complex numbers are not going to be something we'll see a lot. They're totally legitimate. They're valid, but we won't see much of them. Complex numbers tend to be connected to advanced math for the most part. And so it's really going to be more advanced math than we want to study right now. So if you keep going in math, you keep going and see some really high level science at some point in a few years, you'll probably wind up seeing complex numbers be used for real things. But right now we're just sort of going, oh look, complex numbers, that's cool, and we're moving on to something else. So most math courses, especially courses at this level, will limit themselves to just the real number because, you know, if they go too far, it'll get too complex. Get it? 
Ah, as such, unless the question specifically asks about complex numbers or they are directly mentioned in the lesson, such as this one, just stick to the real numbers. So you really want to just stick to the real numbers unless you're working specifically with the complex numbers. You've been told to work specifically with the complex numbers. We'll briefly play with complex numbers in a couple of lessons in this course, but they're best explored something down the road in a more advanced mathematics course or an advanced science course. Thus, in general, limit yourself to using just the real numbers are for now. And really, that's going to be pretty easy because it's what you're used to doing. You're used to just working with the real numbers, so it's not going to be hard to just going back to working with the real numbers because it's what you've been doing for years and years and years. All right, we're ready for some examples. Simplify 25 minus 45i divided by negative 3 plus 4i. So remember, we need to multiply by the conjugate. The conjugate to negative 3 plus 4i, which we could denote with a bar over all the top of it, is equal to negative 3, and then we flip the sign on the imaginary part, so it'll be minus 4i. So we want to multiply this by minus 3 minus 4i over minus 3 minus 4i. Now notice, we have to put parentheses around all of this because the whole thing is multiplying, not just bits and pieces, the whole thing. So we work this out. 25 times negative 3 becomes negative 75. 25 times negative 4i becomes negative 100i minus 100i. Negative 45i times negative 3 will become positive 45, so that's 3, off of, 3 times 5 off of 150, or plus 135i. 45 times 4, so negative 45 times negative 4 becomes positive, so we'll get 4 times 5 off of 200, so 180i, divided by negative 3 times negative 3 gets us positive 9, negative 3 minus 4i gets us plus 12i, plus 4i times negative 3 gets us minus 12i, 4i times negative 4i gets us minus 4i squared. So we see we got minus 12i plus 12i, and also when we have i squared it becomes positive, oh, whoops, accidentally made a typo here, negative 45 times negative 4i will become plus 180i squared. So cancel out that i squared, we get minus 180. Now let's combine things, minus 75, minus 180, that'll get us negative 255. Minus 100i plus 35i will get us plus 35i. What's on the bottom? 4 squared, 4 squared, oh, sorry, it was 4 squared, we missed that, sorry, one more mistake. 4 times 4 gets us minus 4 squared i squared. So 4 squared gets us 16. 9 over 9 plus 16 is our division. So divide by 25. Negative 255 plus 35i divide by 25. We notice that we can pull out a 5 from all of these. This is 5 times 51. This is 5 times 7. This is 5 times 5. So we go through, cancel one of the 5s on all of them. And we're left with negative 51 plus 7i all over 5, which if we wanted to, we could alternately represent as negative 51 over 5 plus 7 over 5i, keeping our imaginary part and our real part completely separate. Both of these totally legitimate answers. We'd know what we're talking about in either case. All right. Second example, given that x equals negative 2 plus i is a root to the below polynomial, find the other root, then verify both. So remember, if x equals negative 2 plus i is one of our roots, the conjugate is also the case. So x bar, the conjugate of x being negative 2 plus i, is going to be, what's the conjugate of that? Negative 2 minus i. So we know what the other root is. The other root is negative 2 minus i, and our first root is negative 2 plus i. We're guaranteed a complex conjugate must be the other root from what we talked about earlier. So now we're told to verify both of them. So there's two different ways we could verify this. First, we could verify this through factors. We could show that if we were to use these as factors, because remember, knowing a root tells you a factor. Remember, if we know that there's a root at k, then we know that there is a factor x minus k. So if we know there's a root at minus 2 plus i, then we know there's a factor of x minus negative 2 plus i. Right? Following that same pattern of x minus k, it's just k in this case is two things, times x minus quantity negative 2 minus i for our other factor. So if we can multiply these two factors together and we can get x squared plus 4x plus 5, then we'll have verified that those must be the roots because they're the factors and there's this deep connection between roots and factors. Right? You can go either way. So let's work this out. Simplify the insides first. x minus times negative, we become plus 2 minus i times x 
minus on minus will become plus 2 plus i. We will start working this out. x times x becomes x squared. x times 2 become plus 2x. x times i will become plus ix. 2 times x will become plus 2x. 2 times 2 will become plus 4. 2 times i will become plus 2i. Negative i times x will become minus ix. Negative i times 2 will become minus 2i. Negative i times plus i will become negative i squared. So negative i squared becomes plus 1 because the i squared cancels out. And now let's work through and see this. So let's simplify this. x squared, how many other x squareds do we have? That's the only one. So we get x squared plus 2x. How many other x's do we have? We've got x there, 2x there, no other x's. So we put those all together and we get plus 4x. ix's, how many ix's do we got? We got that ix, that ix. So ix minus ix, they cancel each other out and they completely nullify each other. So we don't even have to put them down at all. How many constants we got the 4 there? Don't forget the 1 that came out of our i squared. So we've got 4 plus 1 because it flipped the sign. So plus 5, and then 2i minus 2i, once again, they nullify each other. So we get x squared plus 4x plus 5. Checks out. Great. Found the answer. The alternate way we could do this is we could do this by verifying that they are indeed roots. So we could do this other way by showing that they're roots. So let's start off by showing that x equals negative 2 plus i is a root. So we plug that in. We plug that in x squared, negative 2 plus i squared, plus 4 times negative 2 plus i plus 5. Negative 2 plus i squared becomes negative 2 times negative 2 becomes positive 4. Negative 2 on i plus i on negative 2 becomes minus 4i. i on i becomes plus i squared. And then continue on. Plus 4 on negative 2 becomes plus negative 8. 4 on i becomes plus 4i. And keep pull down the 5. So i squared becomes minus a 1. Notice that we've got plus 4i minus 4i, so they eliminate each other here and here. 4 minus 1 becomes 3, negative 8 plus 5 becomes negative 3, and we get 0. Sure enough, that's a root because it produces 0. The other one, let's plug in x equals negative 2 minus i. We plug that one in, negative 2 minus i squared plus 4 times negative 2 minus i plus 5. Negative 2 times negative 2, positive 4. Negative 2 on negative i. Negative i on negative 2 gets us plus 4i. Negative i on negative i gets us plus i squared plus negative 8 minus 4i plus 5. So we see we've got a positive 4i here, negative 4i here. They eliminate each other. We've got this i squared. It becomes negative 1. So 4 and negative 1 gets us 3, negative 8 and 5 gets us negative 3, which once again equals 0, so they're both roots. Two different ways to do it. We can show, hey look, these are the factors that would be given by those roots, and when you multiply those factors, you get back exactly to where you started, so that checks out. Or alternately, we can do it by roots and show, hey, when you plug that in, you get the zeros, so that checks out. Great. Third example, factor x squared minus 8x plus 19. Uh, well, we know this is probably going to involve complex numbers. It's probably a little bit hard to figure it out in terms of complex numbers. But hey, can we find the roots? Sure enough, we can find the roots. So let's find roots, and then we'll use the roots to give us factors. Remember, once you know roots, you know factors, so we find the roots first. We can just use the quadratic formula, because now we can use it on anything. We don't have to worry if it's a complex or not, because the discriminant won't hold us back, because now we can just get imaginary answers as well. So we have x equals the roots occur at negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And hopefully you were able to say that out loud before I said it to yourself because really you want to have that one memorized. I've said it in the last time we talked about the quadratic formula. Quadratic formula comes up enough in math and science. It's ultimately something you really want to have memorized in your back pocket. All right, so what is our b? Our b is negative 8. So we plug that in, negative, negative 8 plus or minus square root negative 8 squared minus 4. What is our a? Our a is a 1 times 1 times what's our c? c is 19 times 19. Let's move that square root over all the way. 2 times a is 1 again, so 2 times 1 equals negative negative 8 gets us positive 8 plus or minus square root 64. What's 4 times 19? That's 76, so minus 76 all over 2. 
We had divide out the two, so we'll get 8 over 2 gets us 4. Plus or minus square root 64 minus 76. It'll still be over 2. Let's put it over that just so we don't forget that. 64 minus 76 gets us negative 12. So we've got 4 plus or minus root negative 12. So we can pull that out as an i. So we'll get square root of 12i over 12 equals 4 plus or minus root 12. What's root 12? Root 12. We can see as square root of 4 times 3, which equals 2 times root 3. So plus or minus 2 root 3i over 2. Hey, look, we've got 2 and 2. Those cancel out. And we are left with all of our roots are when x is equal to 4 plus or minus the square root of 3 times i. Those are our roots. However, those aren't our factors. We want to find what the factors are, so let's get that in another color. So if we know that our roots are 4 plus or minus 3i, remember, if you know k is a root, then that tells you x minus k is a factor. So in this case, our roots are x equals 4 plus root 3i and x equals 4 minus root 3i which is good because they came as a conjugate pairing there, right? So those are both of our possibilities. Those are both of our factors, x minus k. So our factors will be x minus this one right here. So minus quantity 4 plus root 3 times i. Whoops, not that whole thing. Put that parenthesis on the wrong place. i, parenthesis closed there, times quantity x minus this thing here, quantity 4 minus root 3 i, close them all. So now let's simplify it so we can get the factors in a nice, slightly simpler form to look at. x minus 4 minus root 3i and x minus 4 plus root 3i. Great. We factored it by being able to do that. And if we wanted to, we could also expand this and check this and we'd be able to show that that is indeed exactly what it is. Great. Final example, what is i cubed? i to the 4th, i to the 5th, i to the 6th, i to the 7th, i to the 8th, blah, 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 blah. What pattern appears with we, as we go through these powers of i? So let's take a look at how as we work through it. So if we have i to the 1, just plain i, we have i, right? That's just what it is. It's just i. What about when we have i squared? Well, by definition, that was negative 1. So let's see what keeps going as we up this up. i cubed, well, we multiply the one of us by one more i, so we'd get negative 1 times i, or just negative i. i to the 4th would be equal to i times i gets us negative i squared, negative i squared, i squared cancels, and we get positive 1, right? Negative i squared, that cancels, and we get positive 1, so we're left at 1, just a good old plus 1. What if we keep going? i to the fifth is equal to, well, we multiply by 1, so it's just i once again i to the sixth would be equal to i squared, multiplying by one more i, which we know is negative one. i to the seventh is equal to i cubed, which is equal to, hey, we already figured this out. That was negative i. i to the eighth, well, that's going to be equal to i to the fourth, because we can just multiply the one above. Hey, we already figured out what i to the fourth is. That's going to be positive one. Make that plus sign a little clearer. i to the ninth, if we just kept going, we'd have i to the fifth, hey, we already figured out what i to the fifth was, that was i to the one, which is just i, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the pattern repeats. So the pattern repeats every four. So what we need to do is we basically need to divide by four and see what we've got. So what we can do is we can divide exponent of i by four, then, well, what do we do next? Let's do a quick check. If we did i to the ninth, so 4 goes into 9 how many times? Goes in twice. So we'd have 8 minus 8, 1. So we'd get a remainder of 1. So then you look at remainder and that tells you it's equal to i to whatever you just figured out your remainder is. So for example, if we wanted to figure out what i to the 80th is, which is divisible by 4, right? So we can see, oh, that's just i times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4. If we figure that out, i to the 80th, 
then we can figure out that what that is equivalent to by 4. How many times does that go into 80? 4 goes into 8 twice. So that gets us 8 minus 0, bring down the 0, 0. We get 20, and our remainder is 0. So that would be the equivalent of i to the 0th, which is just the same thing as i to the 4th, which is plus 1. So that's how you want to do if you have to, if you're given a really, really, really large i, it's just a question of if you divided it by 4, what would be left over? What would be the remainder? And if you wind up having a remainder of 0, then it fit perfectly, so it winds up coming out just as 1. All right, great. We'll see you at educator.com later, and we'll finally see how complex numbers tell us something about polynomials more than just quadratics. We'll see how they're deeply connected to everything that we've been talking about. It'll be so deep, it's called the fundamental theorem of algebra. All right, see you later. Bye.